Hey guys, this is my favorite week of the class. It is Harry Potter week. Um, I don't have a readings video for you because this is the only book that we're reading this week. I am sitting here with my copy from when I was a kid and it's super beat up and yellow and I love it. Um, and so I'm just going to spend this time talking about the scholarship of Harry Potter because I don't think that um, unless you are a literary scholar, I don't think that many people look at popular contemporary texts in the way that we look at old texts. I mean, we certainly do. It certainly exists. However, and I think that a lot of the times when we see works that have been turned into movies and popularized um, in a way where, you know, there is sort of like a, a very intense following behind you know, a book or a movie or whatever, um, then I think that people see it as having less literary value. And so the reason that I want to have this video and this whole kind of week dedicated to Harry Potter, yes, is because I'm a super fan, um, but I also consider myself a Harry Potter scholar and someone who is interested in analyzing the text beyond just how much I loved it as a kid. Um, and so if you loved Harry Potter as a kid, I encourage you to spend this week not just kind of reminiscing on that feeling or um, not just, you know, enjoying like a possibly easy read, but digging into perspectives of literature that we've talked about so far, um, pulling out things that you can connect to previous British lit, and just really analyzing the text in a different way, kind of like what a friend in grad school called reading with your shoes on. So you're not really that comfortable, you're, you're looking at the text from a different perspective. So that's what I'm going to do in these next couple of slides. I have read through a bunch of scholarly articles to inform a lot of my ideas, so if I feel a little bit rambly, some of the content's a little wonky in my brain, um, and I'm, I'm definitely putting my own spin on the ideas that are presented in the scholarly articles that I've looked at. Um, for some of these slides, and and um, so you know you're you're gonna get mostly just my brain here influenced through a little bit of scholarship. Um, so some things that I want to talk about to start are noteworthy ideas that I think are at, at the heart of Harry Potter. If you are just kind of doing a once over read. Obviously, this is a Bildungsroman book. It's a coming-of-age story. We're looking at a boy who's growing up. This is a, a series of seven, but we can still feel that growth happening. Um, the, the child kind of entering into a transitional phase, leaving childhood, heading for adolescence, um, and, and kind of turning into a man. That happens through the end of the seventh book. Here we're only looking at the first book, but it, it is a coming-of-age story, and it, it, it can certainly be read in that way just within the first text. Um, it is also a classic good versus evil theme. Um, you know, our good and our evil are both uh, in that wizarding world. Harry and his friends and those who support him are the good, and of course Voldemort is the evil, um, and and that, you know, somehow one of the two has to shine out and there has to be a struggle. And so, um, you know, if we're looking at this as a children's story and classic children's literature, you know, by the definition, um, and not until very recently, very recently, uh, did, did evil win. So, you know, some might say that the ending is predictable, but it's, it's in keeping with what we're going to see with children's lit. Um, the text also really closely adheres to a hero's journey archetype that you're going to see in, in um, even some of the most antiquated texts of British, American, whatever lit. And so the graphic that you might see on the screen here is that cyclical hero's journey. Um, the hero is called to adventure, you know, in this case, um, spoilers, <laughs> coming forth. Uh, Harry Potter is 
told of of you know who he is you're a wizard Harry um, and he that is the call to adventure because he's certainly not having much of an adventure in the world with the Dursleys um, crossing the threshold I think that you can look at look at that in a number of ways you know what is the threshold where exactly does the magical world begin and the muggle world end um, that's absolutely a question that a lot of scholars have wanted to know because um, there's a, I'm going to talk about this later in a couple of slides, there's a postmodern perspective that uh, there's not such a clear and distinct um, barrier. So while, yeah, this is a hero's journey and we're looking at this hero's journey archetype, you could say that the Hogwarts Express functions as the threshold, although you know, maybe it's King's Cross because he goes through um, the, the brick barrier, or maybe it's even in, um, in Diagon Alley or before he gets to Diagon Alley, you know, when Hagrid takes him into the pub and Harry goes through the stones that change and present Diagon Alley to him. Is that the threshold? Is that his first experience with the Muggle world? Is that, you know, is it when Hagrid takes him out of uh, the the little shack on in the ocean um, and away from the Dursleys? So there's some questionable, you know, perspectives on how to interpret this hero's journey, but he goes through all of it and comes back around. In every book, he comes back to the Dursleys. He returns to what the hero's journey calls the boon. Um, and then uh, it's also, in its heart, a boarding school novel. You know, think about boarding school. And this is such a Victorian theme. A lot of our neo-Victorian texts especially our YA ones, um, so if you don't know what I just said, neo-Victorian um, would be novels that are published contemporarily, but the setting is in the Victorian period, so new Victorian. Still Victorian, but not published in the Victorian time. Um, I am thinking of A Great and Terrible Beauty, if anyone has read that. That's a YA, which is young adult text, and so um, it, it's exploring themes uh, that are extremely common in children's lit, which is parentless children. Whether that's um, parentless because in Harry's case, again, spoilers, Harry's parents have died, um, or whether that's parentless because the parents aren't present, like not present because the kids went off to boarding school and so they have to find some other kind of mentor, father-like, mother-like figure, or not present because the author is giving these children scenarios where the parents just aren't around. They're working, they're uh, not involved in the children's lives or what have you, and so um, this, this theme of children's lit and having very parentless children is, is something you're if you look back at a lot of the children's books that you've read, you're going to see children doing very independent things that um, I'm not certain children should be doing, but it gives the child, you know, at the heart of children's lit, it gives the child the opportunity to um, have these explorations with the world that if there was a parent standing over and helping that child navigate it, they wouldn't be able to have. So um, it offers an option. And of course, if we operate under the assumption that literature should be read in order to get a perspective of the other, other people that we are not, then uh, giving children the opportunity to read a book where there are no parents, gives them, gives their brains at least the opportunity to kind of figure out what they might do in a certain situation or to safely explore unsafe situations, I guess you could say. So um, the boarding school novel that we have with Harry Potter is certainly at the heart of this too because Harry leaves his home, the home that he's known for 11 years, regardless of how much we can criticize that home and how much better Hogwarts is, he's going away from home um, to a place where he's sleeping and he's learning and he's making friends and that is certainly at the heart of um, this novel. So if it's nothing bigger for you, it is just, it's an example of a boarding school novel. Um, so one of the really interesting things is the setting and 
I think that it's something that always drew me in because, uh, let's see, when was this text published? My copy says 1997, so some, somewhere around there. Um, you know, we're looking at when, like, technology and the internet was becoming completely immersed into our lives, um, and where now everybody's getting a computer and uh, we didn't really have cell phones at the time this book was published, but um, they're, they're on the cusp, you know, maybe some people had cell phones, um, but technology was just kind of big and huge um, and coming into its own in, in the forms that we have today. So we have what I'm calling this post-industrial book um, with a pre-industrial setting, meaning it's written in postmodern times after the Industrial Revolution, now that kind of technology is just second nature. But Hogwarts doesn't have electricity. Um, and I think that there are arguments that say, you know, Hogwarts doesn't have electricity because, like, magic and electricity don't really work together. The magic ruins the electricity, and that's why J.K. Rowling was able to get away with um, having in, you know, it's, it's not like there's not electricity and modern themes in the Muggle world but there are at Hogwarts. So um, I think there, that's the workaround here. Um, but what's really fascinating is the fact that the timing in which the text was written influences all of the possibilities that Hogwarts holds. Pictures that move, paintings that talk, mail that arrives instantly, um, you know, moving staircases. Like We have all of those things in the modern world. Pictures that move, we've got TVs. Paintings that talk, we've got TVs. Um, mail that arrives almost instantly, we've got email and text message. We've got escalators, you know. So, um, the... Fantasy has always given us the opportunity to imagine things of the future. Here, Harry Potter isn't futuristic and it's not pre the time period in which it was written. It exists exactly in the time period in which it was written. And yet we get the opportunity to have this pre-industrial setting. And so it does a really interesting thing to the, the postmodern reader because it forces us, us, if we're looking at it critically and analytically, it forces us to say, how has industry and technology influenced this text? Why is she taking that away? Why is Rowling getting rid of technology in certain spaces? And what is the effect of that? And, and even question one step further, is she really getting rid of technology or is she reinventing it um, and to make it seem like there's no technology and almost sort of like glorify this old setting with new concepts? I hope that's making some sense and maybe you guys will have some interesting ideas on that. Um, the other thing that really is interesting about this setting is the visibility of Hogwarts. So. I think that this also reflects a lot of ideas in children's lit in that um, children, so okay, if we're thinking about childhood and we're thinking about this Victorian perspective, you know, children should be seen and not heard. Children um, are just seen as kind of offshoots of their parents and they don't really have a voice for themselves. And modern children's lit is giving those children a voice and giving them a place to have a voice and Hogwarts is functioning as that, you know, in, in at the Dursleys, Harry is bossed around. That's, that's pretty much what happens. Um, and, you know, he gets to have his cupboard under the stairs, but even the Dursleys find a way to, you know, insert themselves into that space for him. But at Hogwarts, he has a space of his own. Um, and so the setting is interesting because we see him kind of... Uh, coming into his own self here at this space, this space, this space where he can be seen and he can be heard, and in fact, not just that he can be seen, but the that he is a celebrity. I mean, he's the center of attention at this space. And again, if children's lit offers an opportunity for children to experience something they normally wouldn't, then Hogwarts gives that to the reader, so to speak. And ultimately, what I mean by that 
is that Hogwarts is new for Harry and he's navigating these experiences of newness that, you know, think back to your childhood and your adolescence and your pre-adolescence, um, you had a lot of new experiences that you had to navigate. Hogwarts does that. And, you know, we have we see that in obvious ways, such as building friendships and dealing with conflict within friendships and um, having, you know, people at your school who are sort of like the bully and the villain, um, friends, acquaintances, best friends, people who you don't really like who end up becoming your best friend, all of these completely, dare I say, and I'm using air quotes here, normal uh, childhood adolescent experiences. He's certainly na navigating through those, but we also have almost, you know, again, if you're interpreting the text with an analytical eye, you will see this. There are things about Hogwarts that are changing. And once Harry has figured something out, like the pathway up the stairs through the picture of the fat lady and into Gryffindor Tower, then the staircase has changed and he has to figure it out all over again. And so um, this kind of not only speaks to the constantly changing nature of learning how to live life in the eyes of a kid or a teen or preteen, just like the world is def different every day, um, but it also speaks to this uh, postmodern viewpoint on you, when you think you know it, it kind of upends itself and now we have to move, we have to relearn it um, which is a really fascinating thing to analyze um one of the other postmodern interpretations that is very very common throughout analyzing the series but you can see it in the first text as well is just this concept of the other what's very fascinating about this is that both our magic world and our muggle world function as the other for each other, but then um, it's not that black and white, right? Because we have a character, multiple characters, um, but Hermione in particular, who is a blend of the magic and the muggle. Um, and so the, you know, at the very first chapter of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, we don't get Harry's perspective. Is that right? The first chapter, the second chapter, um, we get... Yeah, first chapter, we get Mr. Dursley's perspective. So we're in the muggle world to begin with, and he's noticing all sorts of very strange things, and he notices people in cloaks and what is going on, what are they wearing. And so here, through this perspective of Mr. Dursley, we, the reader, are viewing the magical world as the other, as the strangeness, as the weirdness, as the place that is criticized, particularly um, toward the end of that chapter when... Mr. Dursley and Mrs. Dursley are talking about their in-laws, right, Mrs. Dursley's sister's family, um, well, yeah, her husband and her, their son, and they're very strange, for it. they don't talk about them, they push them aside, they suppress them, um, you know, we get this kind of, we don't want to look at that, we don't want to talk about that, these magical people are the other, and it presents for a reader a very interesting question of, you know, what's going on and why is it this way? Um, it's certainly a helpful plot device, but if we're looking at it critically, the postmodern cultural studies perspective, we see magic as the other. And again, Hogwarts is that space where the other can exist because the other has been um, ostracized from the muggle world. In um, later on, we learn how that happens um, later on in the series, uh, but we also get Muggle as the other, right? So as, as we are reading further and we realize that um, not, all, not all wizards have felt, um, I guess, negatively affected by this divide between magic and Muggle, uh, you know, we have the Malfoys who exist as a pure blood uh, family where the muggle is seen as the other, and in later books we get derogatory terms for um, that mixed 
breed, I guess, so to speak, um, where Hermione is both witch and muggle all at the same time. And I think that this kind of blends in a, a very strangely postmodern way. You know, there's not there's not a center and there's not a um, a one reality. The the magical world can find otherness in the muggle world, and the muggle world can find otherness in the magic world, and there's a blend between the two. This inability to define exactly what is other and what is not other um, is very postmodern in that you can't you can't really do it. There's very many gray areas. There's so much subjectivity in terms of how you're interpreting um, the text and how you're reading it. And there's going to be, t there are tons and tons of scholarly articles that are really exploring this theme, exploring the theme of class. You know, um, there, there are racist, classist ideas um, in the politics in the magical world that are affected in the muggle world and that's one of the things that again this good versus evil Harry ends up sort of becoming a voice for the other um, and yet he isn't the other he's the celebrity he's the popular person so there's so much gray area and if you want a text that wholeheartedly defines postmodernism, you've got one. Deconstruction and just kind of all of the breaking down of what we think is the reality of the situation. Even the reality of how we're analyzing the situation gets broken down when we look at it through a postmodern lens. It's, it's absolutely fascinating and, and Hermione kind of offers us this, this particular gray space. Um, one of the perspectives that, and this is my second to last slide, but one of the perspectives that I despise entirely, um, and yet I feel compelled to tell you about it, and this is really more of a pop culture theory I couldn't find, at least in our, um, in, in what we have access to, I couldn't find uh, scholarship on this, so I'm not certain about it. I, I would say this is likely a psychoanalytical perspective on Harry, possibly J.K. Rowling, although I don't I don't dig too far into, um, you know, sort of the, the um, traditional perspective that the author fully influences the text, while I think that J.K. Rowling's life situation, where she was, um, you know, her beliefs, things like that, all influence the text. I, I don't really like to read it through that lens, but anyway. I think that this is sort of a psychoanalytic and postmodern perspective, um, again, really through the lens of subjectivity and particularly with something that we've talked about before, which is the unreliable narrator. So there is a pop culture theory, so this is like internet theory, um, out there that suggests, and it's it's uh, valid, it's, it's a logical way to interpret the text, I just don't like it. Um, it suggests that Hogwarts isn't real at all. There isn't really anything such as magic. Harry is so abused at the Dursleys that he's schizophrenic. He formulate, uh, I think that that's the correct word to use. I'm um, sorry for all the dinging, you guys. Someone is, is Facebooking me. Um, anyway, so the schizophrenic might not be the correct term or most PC word. I think there's something better that I should be using, but I can't think of it right now. Um, multiple personalities disorder, I think is what I'm supposed to say. Okay, so the theory is that Harry was so abused that he formulated this multiple personality and um, the Hogwarts was a pl an escape for him. He existed in the world because I can't say the muggle world because it, through this theory there's no real muggle versus magic world. Harry has created this world because of his abuse, um, because of his isolation, because of his confinement. Um, you know, everything going on at the Dursleys happened, everything under the stairs happened, but him walking through Harry's magical Harry's life is him trying to deal with the um, verbal, possible physical abuse of the Dursleys 
in his brain. And so then there is a theory that everything is happening inside of Harry's head. Again, I, I think that if you're interested in it, it's worth analyzing. But I don't particularly like it because um, I just... I don't, I don't like, I, I, th I think the, the ending of a text to say everything was all a dream is, is a cop out, um, you know, certainly as an author, but, so it's not something I want to necessarily explore, but I want you to know that it exists out there. Um, so the other concept, this is the one that is the most interesting, uh, I think, and for the, the public and scholars blended together is what I'm just going to call the Harry Potter controversy. And so I'm trying to think back because I remember in fifth grade, my teacher was going to read uh, Harry Potter to us and then she told us that she couldn't um, and we ended up reading a different book instead. Um, and let's see, when I was in fifth grade, oh, I don't even know what year that was, but I think it was book four that had come out at that point. So it was after The Sorcerer's Stone had been published at least, what, three years or so. Um, and, and so the Harry Potter controversy is interesting because it presents a very strange irony in that Harry Potter has been attempted to be banned from the classroom, and I'm not talking about college classrooms, I'm talking about um, classrooms where parents are involved, so like senior year and below, but particularly if we're talking about children's lit, likely elementary and middle school classrooms. So the text has been um, attempted to be banned from the classroom for being too pagan and, fascinatingly enough, for being too Christian. Um, so. I want to explore sort of those ideas. Um, essentially, the the text being too pagan, uh, there's a, there's a, a big, um, particularly with like the evangelical Christian community, um, there's a big fight. And and actually, I should say there was a big fight. I think that there's still a perspective of this that circles through. Um, I'm unfamiliar to say too much on it, but. Um, from my research, there's, it, at the height of this controversy, which is no longer happening today, um, not to say that there's not, but at the height of this, I think it was like 7% of people surveyed said they, they had a, a religious problem with Harry Potter. So it wasn't, even at the height of it, it was specific voices that were very powerful and not a huge collective. But anyway, um, that Harry Potter is banned from the classroom because it promotes magic, um, because it promotes the occult, and particularly because it promotes the study of um, the Wicca faith or religion, and I don't know if that's the proper terminology, but um, so, and, and you know, there's a lot of back and forth on how, whether that is correct or not. There's input from J.K. Rowling. Um, there's, you know, comparisons to what it means to practice that Wicca. Again, I don't know if this is, can I call it the religion of Wicca? I don't know. Um, but I don't read too much of this. I'm not really, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I want to tell you about it because I'm, you may have heard of it. So the Harry Potter controversy is interesting because, yeah, this is a magical world where even the good people are magic. And so I think that in the, in the heart of this controversy is the problem, um, taking a it's too pagan perspective. So it the fear was that it would promote the study of magic um, away from sort of that Christian perspective. Interestingly enough, the book has been attempted to be banned from the classroom for being too Christian for even more reasons. Um, Dumbledore functions in, in multiple pieces of scholarship. People have analyzed Dumbledore as a Christ-like figure um, and sort of how he mentors Harry through all of his trials. Um, even Harry has been analyzed as a Christ-like figure. Um, King's Cross has been interpreted to be um, a place 
that represents heaven. And again, we're not talking about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We're talking about later books, particularly book seven. Um, so in thinking about the original controversy of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone being too pagan, I guess it makes sense that that is the prevailing um, kind of outcry against the text. Um, I, I, I think slash wonder, and scholarship has suggested that the majority of people who are not scholars, who disagree with Harry Potter being studied uh, at any length, um, likely aren't reading the text. Um, many parents hear Sorcerer's Stone or hear from other parents in their circles that the, the text promotes the uh, magic and occult too heavily, understandably so. I mean, it's about a bunch of kids going and studying magic. Um, it is such a phenomenal text that the fear is their uneducated children, you know, in, uneducated in things of the world, would be drawn to that. So it certainly makes sense just in the, that first text alone. And if the first text doesn't give someone a, a pause to say, you know, well, before I disagree with it, I'm going to, um, I'm going to denounce it. They're definitely not going to get to the seventh book where, I mean, we're, we're looking at heavily Christian themes and, and in so much as to, um, have this, have people argue that J.K. Rowling is promoting Christianity in her books and that there's no way these should even be incorporated in a library because they, um, like, like a school, public school library, because they don't um, promote the separation of church and state. So that's absolutely fascinating. There's also the argument, again, for the text being too Christian that the books cre preach Christian morals and values. J.K. Rowling has come back and said, well, you don't have to have Christianity to be a moral person. Again, that's J.K. Rowling's uh, take on that situation. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, particularly in Muslim countries, um, non-Christian practicing countries, the texts have certainly been cause for controversy, be controversy because Harry Potter, even in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, they're celebrating Christmas, they're celebrating Easter, their funerals incorporate um, religious symbols like crosses and um, religious practices of funerals and think burying the dead and things like that. So um, the, the, it's notably Christian in its understanding of the world, both the magical world and the muggle world, um, and certainly you don't have to read Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or any of the Harry Potter books and get a Christian perspective or um, a pagan perspective um, if you truly understand what those two things mean. Um, you don't have to take a religious perspective on reading the book at all, but this is a huge controversial point of the text, so it's worth talking about here. Um, of course, then, there is the most recent, actually, I don't even think it's the most recent, um, and this is something I personally have issue, I take issue with, which I will explain in just a minute. Um, uh, J.K. Rowling has come out to say that Dumbledore, she has always thought of uh, Professor Dumbledore as a gay character. So um, the Catholic perspective on that is that, you know, if if Dumbledore is gay, then his trajectory and plotline, again, happening, kind of playing out toward the end of the whole series, not, not the Sorcerer's Stone, um, but if he is gay, then his path reflects Catholic teachings of homosexuality because his relationship with Grindelwald um, was not positive, um, and thus reflects a possibility, again, from Catholic teachings, that uh, homosexuality is wrong. So there's an entire scholarship discussion on Catholicism um, and how Harry Potter promotes Catholicism in terms of homosexuality. And so, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, I can link you to the right scholarship to read on that. Uh, regarding J.K. Rowling's claim that Dumbledore is gay, I think there's merit in finding, even in the very first text, possibilities of that. 
the problem that I have with it is, um, and the things that she has done since then, you know, I think, I think, I have not seen this, um, I think that one of her characters is transgender, so I don't, that I don't personally think any of that is problematic. The problem for me is coming out after the fact and, and saying that your characters are, um, you know, different other than being heterosexual and cisgender. Um, for me, that's problematic because it, it just suggests like you're going along with the times and your characters might not have actually been that. But here, you feel like you have to say it. I don't know if that's really what's happening. I don't know what's in J.K. Rowling's head and, and how she's feeling about her characters. Um, but I, I think that if your character, and you know, any future authors in the room, if your character is going to be different, then make them different and make it, make them awesome. Um, and, and so that's sort of my, why I find that to be problematic because, um, you know, Dumbledore's, sexuality, if it's, if it's an important component of his path, we don't see it. Now, we see Harry's viewpoint throughout the majority of the story. Do students need to know the sexuality of their teachers? No, I don't think so. Um, but I think it's just, it's interesting. It's a point of controversy, and it's something that's worthwhile to study. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's kind of everything that, that I've got here for our big Harry Potter lecture. There's there's so many things that we could talk about in this book. There's so many places that I hope you guys will explore in your responses for this week and in your questions and answers. Um, if I have graded harshly at all this semester, I will grade the harshest in this week because I am obsessed with this text and I'm fascinated with how people are going to interpret it and I want your best writing here in this week. Um, and so if you want to explore anything else, if you want to talk about anything that I've said that might be confusing, if you read through any of these scholarly articles that I cite throughout these this PowerPoint or even in um, the, the uh, supplementary readings for the week, not required, by the way, just possibilities if you're interested, um, then, you know, let me know. I can try to clarify. There's some things that I read in the scholarship that I have to Google uh, because I don't fully understand some of these very heavy uh, literary theory um, critiques. So I wanted to end on something super cool, like my favorite quote from Harry Potter, but I just can't. Um, so happy Harry Potter week, you guys, and if you need me, you know what to do.